So I'm going to talk about uh, the Windows uh, PD drivers project today. Uh, just sort of give a stage and updates. Uh, I'm just going to go into a bit of background. Right. Um, the history of the, the Zen Project PV drivers actually lies back in the Citrix PV drivers from uh, years ago. Uh, they were developed for the Zen server projects in the early days. Uh, they probably still called Zen Enterprise at the time. Um, and it's currently been rebranded as Citrix Hypervisor. <laughs> um, the drivers were closed source, uh, so they were entirely developed for Zen servers, so they made a lot of assumptions about the Zen server environment, custom hacks we were carrying in the hypervisor, custom hacks we were carrying in DOM0, particular PV, particular PV backend versions, etc. Um, and there were a lot of interdependencies between the drivers. So for instance, if you wanted to upgrade your network driver, um, you'd have to, you know, it, it may be making calls into the storage driver, bizarrely, uh, and you know, there was a lot of binary dependencies. It was, they were a complete mess, uh, and as a result, they had to be installed together as a unit. Uh, so there was a, a dedicated NSYS-based installer, which is Nordsoft's script for install system, um, which installed them as yeah, a single blob, essentially, um, to try and avoid these, sort of running into these binary interdependencies, which is really, really hard in Windows anyway, and so you still got blue screens occasionally when Windows decided to pull in some of your code, but not all of your code. Um, so we, we used to reboot a lot. Um, and uh, this was not exactly popular. Um, so we used the drivers all the way up to uh, just prior to Zen Server 7. At Zen, at Zen Server 7, we decided to switch over to a new set of drivers. Uh, so the new Zen server PV drivers, the main thing about them was they were completely rewritten. Uh, so they were, it was a ground up rewrite essentially. Um, I did pull in some of the old code, but it was very, very small amounts of the old code that I'd probably written in the first place. Uh, we wanted to sort of get rid of stuff we didn't know where it had come from. We wanted to get rid of reliance on custom hacks. Um, we, this, this was a useful thing for developers because it meant we could develop uh, new front ends against upstream Zen and upstream Linux where the features may not yet exist in Zen server. Uh, so we could basically do the front end development work whilst the integration work for the back end was being done. Uh, we didn't have a dependency where we had to pull the back end first and then write the front end work uh, into, so that we could test it. Um, interdependencies were removed or controlled, so there was no direct function calls between the modules anymore. Um, and we use something called interfaces to talk between to talk between the drivers. I'll talk about interfaces later. Um, the, uh, the the lack of interdependencies, the lack of the binary uh, interdependencies, meant that we could install uh, the drivers separately in any order. This avoided the need for unnecessary reboots. So you know, if you're upgrading the network driver, you just update the network driver. Your network went down, it came back up again. Everything was good. No need to reboot the VM. Um, it also meant we could post the drivers on Windows Update. Uh, we could post the drivers on Windows Update, which is a, a very popular thing from, our, from a customer point of view because it means you didn't have to run a custom installer. Uh, and yeah, the, the way that Zen Server typically distributes the custom installer is that we have uh, a CD-ROM image, and that would have to be mounted on every single VM on your server, and then you'd have to manually run the installer from every single VM, so this is not great. Whereas, if we post the drivers to Windows Update, you just let Windows do its own thing. It'll update when it's ready, and you don't have to worry about keeping your system up to date. Um, it, all, all the drivers also, uh, because we knew where all the code came from, we can make them fully open source. They're actually BSD licensed, uh, and as a result, they were adopted as the official PD drivers by the Zen project. Um, so they are. Yeah, they, they now available via the Zen Project website. So the crucial URLs, uh, the project front page at the top there, uh, you don't have to read these now. Uh, drive repositories on Zenbit, uh, drive binaries, we have a public build system, the, the um, yeah, it's a continuous integration system using Jenkins, so you will get up-to-date builds if you want them, and there are also signed release builds as well. And then there's a mailing list when the screen comes back. There we go. So uh, I'll just go into a bit of background about the structure of the drivers, uh, but before I can go into any detail, I need to sort of give you a small background in Windows device drivers anyway. 
So uh, Windows device drivers deal with something called device objects. There's generally three types of device objects you have to worry about. Uh, the first I'm going to show here is the physical device object. Windows has a physical device object essentially to represent every node in its bus topology. So every PCI device essentially gets a physical device object. Everything on the top level ACPI enumeration gets a physical device object, etc. Um, I'll call these pink. The function device objects um, are created by drivers when they start to use physical device objects. We'll kind of get into the detail of that. I'm going to call these blue. Uh, and then something called a filter device object, uh, which because FDO was already taken, we shortened to filterDO, which is not so catchy. Uh, and they sort of interpose between FDOs and PDOs, and we'll look at that in a moment. I'll call those green. So uh, device objects form a hierarchy. Uh, the, um, so the, the entity that, that deals with these things is called a bus driver. So a bus driver essentially binds to a physical, um, has a function device object as its basis, and then it's able to create new physical device objects when it enumerates the bus that it's responsible for. Um, so the PDOs relate to nodes in the bus topology, um, and they form a tree that grows downwards. The function device, the function, a function driver binds to a physical device object. As you see at the top there, the bus driver also has a function device object. We'll kind of come to why that is in a moment. So if we just look at pure function driver, not a bus driver this time, uh, it then essentially it's called binds to the uh, it binds to the physical device object when the when Windows loads that function driver against the physical device. Right. But how does Windows know which function driver to bind to which physical device object, which function driver to tell about which physical device object? Well, that's done by name. So the bus driver, when it creates the physical device object, gives a name. Um, so typically the name is formed of the actual driver name itself, and then a name that's assigned to the physical device object. The Windows, these are normally separated by a backslash. In, when you install a function driver into Windows, you install it, you, know, you, you give Windows the binary, but you also give it what's called an inf file here, which kind of describes the binding, essentially. Right, so you can see that the, that's the end of it. But there is a tag there that basically references the name of the physical device object, and that's how Windows knows which function drive to load against which physical device object. What about filter driver, filter device objects? Well, filter device objects, as I said before, interpose between function device objects and physical device ob objects. And there's a communication mechanism that Windows uses between these two object types that's called ERPS. ERPS stands for IO request packet. So when the, um, when the function driver needs its bus driver to do something for it, it sends an IO request packet up, the, up to the bus driver. The filter, device, filter driver can interpose on these via the filter device object. So it can either complete them straight back, it can forward them on with modifications, it can forward them on and then modify the results on the way back. It can do whatever it likes. Uh, and those are installed by use, by means of uh, registry keys. Um, so you can install filter driver of filter device objects between function and bus, uh, physical device objects using by, or by class or by name. So if you just say, just modifying the registry will do that for you. Now, coming back to our original diagram, you can kind of see why this has a, a function device object as well, because the bus driver, yeah, function drivers can also be bus drivers. So we have a function driver here that finds its function device object to the physical device object, but then it creates the more physical device object, and so on. And you get this, uh, you know, this tree structure that, that grows from the root. So if we look specifically at the Windows PB drivers, they have this architecture, so this Physical device object at the top is actually the Zen platform device, so that's created by QEMU and is enumerated by the PCI bus driver, which is why I've not shown that here. So that sort of pre-exists in the system. We install the Zen bus driver. So as it's FDO, it creates, well, I've just shown the core drivers here, so it, I've only shown two of the physical device objects it creates. So it creates one for the network subsystem over here, one for the storage subsystem over here, we have a filter device object that sits between. Uh, that's class-based fills, so we'll come, for, come to the reason for that in a moment. <laughs> then we have the network subsystem here. Actually, I've got a, sort of some rings here. 
Yeah, so uh, that's the main bus infrastructure. They said this is the network subsystem over here. Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Network service system over here, so that it's formed of two drivers. There's, there's the class driver here called ZenVIF, and it's called the, after the, the node in, in ZenStore. So, you know, network devices are enumerated using like local domain, foo, device, VIF, some number. So, this is basically the class driver for VIF devices. And then there's the individual network devices here. So, you know, the VIF enumerates like VIF 0, 1, 2, etc. And then you have an individual network device that binds to those. Uh, over in the storage thing, we have like VBD. So we have ZenVBD here, which is the class drive for that. It creates PDOs. We don't have to supply a function drive for disks because Windows has a generic disk driver that's shipped as part of the system. So, yeah, I'll go with that. So, as I said, this is created by the Zen platform device or the Zen PB device. Now, if you want Windows Update, um, then you have to bind this whole infrastructure to a slightly differently named PCI device, uh, which is freely available for anyone to use, but it is a licensed feature of Zensor for <laughs> product marketing reasons. It has device ID C000, uh, whereas the standard Zen platform device has device ID 0001. Um, now, as I said, we have this filter. That's a class-based filter. So, so not only does it sit between the Zen platform uh, PCI device object in Zenbus as FDO, it also sits between every single PCI device that Windows enumerates and the thing that binds to it. And the reason we do this is because, say we have, um, say we bring up the system, it has an emulated network. This is the normal way that uh, the, key, yeah, the, the system is, the VM is provisioned. Um, and then say, yeah, we, we built this infrastructure, we load it all in, the PV driver loads, now we're gonna get slightly weird behavior if we have a para-virtual network device in the system and the emulated device in the system at the same time. So there is an unplug protocol that we can use via QEMU to unplug that PCI device, that emulated network device, but we really don't want them in the system at the same time. So we can use this filter driver here to determine whether the emulated device is present or not. Because the whole infrastructure where this loads can basically, I, I can make calls using this interface mechanism, which I'll describe in a minute, directly up to this thing and say like, hey, is the emulated network device around? In which case, I make sure this thing doesn't load. Uh, and then when we do the unplug, I can basically say, well, yeah, the emulated device is gone. Now it's safe to load the PV device. There's actually one more driver. Um, this doesn't actually have any device objects that it manages. It's called Zen.sys. Um, Windows has the notion of an export driver as well. Um, an export driver is essentially just a library. Uh, and in fact, its entry point is called DLL initialize, so actually it really is a kernel-based DLL. And we use that to talk to Zen. Uh, the reason we use uh, an export driver like that is we can get it to load really, really early during boot. Um, so we can actually start to you know, talk to Zen, we can set up our hypercall table, you know, we, we can do all the initialization very, very early before anything else in the system starts to do, starts to boot. Um, these are the packages, so there's basically um, yeah, there's four packages there which form the core of the system. So, so this is the so the main infrastructure, so it's it's called Zenbus, and we have the, the ZenVIF package here, which is the network class, ZenVBD for the storage class, and then the individual network driver package here. But obviously, well, wait a minute, it's going to be the wrong way. There we go. Right. Um, when we enumerate the PV network devices, we need to talk to ZenStore or something like that. We need set up event channels, we need grants. How do we do that when it's this Zen driver up here that's talking to Zen? We can't make direct function calls. We said that's a bad idea because of the binary compatibilities that it introduces. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's where the interfaces come in. So I'm going to talk about those now. So interfaces. There's kind of two players in the interface. With, there's what we call the provider of the interface and the subscriber to the interface. 
Now, it so happens that Windows actually provides one of those IA request packet structures for this purpose, so we make use of that. So when the subscriber, which is typically the function driver, uh, function driver, wants to talk to the provider, which is typically a bus driver that sits somewhere above it in the hierarchy, it can send an IA request packet called the query interface packet. And it supplies two pieces of information, which is a, a the GUID, which is essentially the name of the interface, and it supplies the version, so the version of the interface that it knows about. Because obviously the function driver may be of a different vintage to the bus driver, so it supplies the version of the interface that it knows how to use. And when the provider gets this query, it will then send back the jump table essentially. So you're going to have a method, set of methods in the table, so function pointers, and you're going to have some private context information, which the bus driver needs to make to, to do the right thing when it gets one of those method calls. There's two that are always supplied as part of any interface. There's an acquire and a release call. Now, the, these are not, uh, these are used for reference counting, but these are not used to reference count the actual interface structure itself. It's always safe to use this interface structure, these function points. This memory is never going to go away because there's a, a parent child relationship between these drivers. So, this driver can't be unloaded before this driver has been unloaded because there's a dependency there that Windows has which means it's always safe to indirect through those function pointers. The reason for the ref counting is that because certain, you know, say you were putting your VM into S4 Hibernate, um, that means that when it resumes, it's going to come back in a different domain container, and it's going to have to build all its infrastructure with Den completely from scratch. So we use these reference counting to make sure that all these drivers, as we go into uh, the S4 power state, actually tear down their interfaces to Zen. They, they release all their dependencies on branch table, on event channels, etc. And we make sure that all the, re all the reference counts fall to zero for all the interfaces before we allow the system to go into suspend. That way we know it's safe to come back out of suspend and build our, build our state again. So there's various interfaces that are provided by different drivers. So this is not an exhaustive list. Um, so Zenbus provides most of them because it's the basic infrastructure driver. So there's a debug interface, uh, which I think I've got text for here yet. So uh, every driver in the hierarchy can register a debug callback. So when you do the control A, control A, control A, Q key on the serial console, or if you do XL debug keys Q, then it fires a, a virtual interrupt, which Zenbus hooks, and then it calls all the driver's debug callbacks and they get to dump all their state uh, by the, uh, the debug port. Uh, so if you go into, I guess, for upstream Zen, if you look at the queue in your output, that's where it'll go. The Zen server goes into daemon.log. Um, there's a suspend interface. So when we do a Zen suspend, which happens during a migrate or a, or a save, um, obviously the um, drivers need to re-establish connection with their backends when they come out, so they register callbacks with the suspend interface. There's an early callback and a late callback. Early callbacks are called with interrupts disabled very, very early on because you come back out of the shed up hyper call. Uh, late callbacks are called slightly later with interrupts enabled, but the system is still single threaded at that point. We corral all the vCPUs apart from the one that makes the shed up hyper call. So that way you can ensure that things come back serially before you let the system go. These three are relatively self-explanatory. When you can see them. There we go. That is uh, a range set interface. Uh, so Windows is really bad at providing like useful kernel interfaces. Um, so this is uh, used very in various places in the uh, PV drivers for doing resource allocation. Um, so for instance, in the grant tables, uh, yeah, obviously we need to allocate grant references, free grant references. So we use this range set API for that. And then there's a cache interface, which is basically a pseudo slab allocator. Um, I needed, or, or I wanted the, the sort of the thing that sl the slab allocators give you, which is when you allocate an object, you can have a, a constructor function, you can have a destructor function when you tear it down. So these things get pre-called before you get hold of the memory when you do an allocate. Uh, I call it pseudo slab allocator because I don't actually do slab allocation underneath. So slab allocation, you would allocate like a page at a time fill it with objects, call all their constructors, 
and then have them ready to go. I don't actually do that because basically I didn't have time when I implemented it. Uh, so it actually uses the, the standard non-page pool allocator underneath. At one point, I, at some point, I will actually make it a proper slab allocator because it would be more efficient. Uh, and then there's the, the VIF process implementation. Now, because Windows is paying on the backside, and when you write a network driver, you have to subscribe to this thing called the, the Endis mini port interface. It very much restricts what a network driver can do in terms of making kernel calls. Um, so actually, you put, you put most of the network implementation, the protocol implementation, in the class driver. Class driver doesn't have to be a mini port driver. It's just a standard Windows kernel driver. So it's got much more freedom, which is why we put it there. So the, Endis, the, the Zen Net driver actually is a very, very thin driver. It's just an Endis mini port driver that literally makes calls into Zenvif. Zenvif does the work, gets the return back. But how do you deal with compatibility? As I said, the reason for interfaces is so we can control the calls between drivers. We don't make direct function calls. We do it by these jump tables. And the reason we do that is because we want to ensure compatibility and the ability to unload and reload drivers. So as I said, when we do the query interface, we specify a GUID, which is the name of the interface. We specify a version, which is what the function driver knows about. It pass gets passed up to the provider. Let's say the provider only implements version Y of that interface. We're going to have to say, well, we don't support you, sorry. Uh, now, that could be quite bad because, say that function driver is managing your system disk, uh, that's going to be pretty fatal. Your VM is not going to be able to boot. So you're going to get a blue screen, which is not a good thing. So we have to follow some rules. So the provider, when it does it interface implementations, needs to be stay compatible with older versions of that implementation. There's no reason if it implements version Y of an interface that it can't also implement version X. Typically, the only difference between these things as they evolve is I add a new function or I change some arguments. So yeah, we can just maintain both versions of the interface. Usually, you could in, you, know, you can implement the new version of the interface and then have a compatibility shim which allows you to implement the older version on top of the new version. Each new version, when we modify the version of an interface, we must make sure that we create a new name for the PDF. Uh, as I said before, PDFs have names, but PDFs can actually have more than one name, which is kind of useful. So, for a provider that implements version X, in this case, I'm going to say like it creates PDFs with name bar one. Version Y, it's going to create PDFs with name but with name version two. But well, you know, because we stay compatible and we implement both version X and Y, we're going to name that PDF with both those names. And that means that when we bind, we in the provider specify. Say this provider, we know this provider wants version X, or sorry, this subscriber wants version X of that interface. In that case, it needs to bind to the version of the PDO that supplies that, so the, the name of the PDO that supplies that version of the interface. And if we do all these things, then when we upgrade the provider, we know that we're safe because we stay compatible with the old version of the interface. So all the function drivers that are already in the system, they're going to be fine. They're still going to be able to query for their old version of the interface, and they're going to get it. They're not, there's nothing going to fail. But can we upgrade this for subscribers? So say I have an old version of the provider that only provides version X of the interface. Now I install a new, version, new, new subscriber that actually wants version Y now. That's not going to be safe because it's not going to load. But happily, because we selected the new name of the PDO, that old version of the provider doesn't supply that name yet. So it's not there in the system. That means that Windows, when we install that new version of subscriber driver, is, you know, Windows is going to see it and it's going to say, all right, this driver binds to that name. That name doesn't exist in the system yet, so I'm not going to load it. I'm still going to load the old version of the driver. Now when we upgrade the provider, now it supplies version Y, and it has the new PDO name. Windows is saying, oh, I've already got a driver for that, so now I'm going to upgrade the subscriber. So that way we can make sure that things don't get upgraded until they're going to work. So, yeah, I mean, one thing to mention is, is that in Windows, basically, you never uninstall anything. Old versions of drivers always exist in Drive Store. You, you never remove them. So that way, Windows should always have a driver that works for whatever version of the PDOs is, is, is available. 
So talking about the actual project status now. So the first thing to mention is we graduated. Um, Lars mentioned this yesterday. We're no longer in incubation. We are now a full project. Um, the other thing to mention is that uh, a few weeks ago I signed a new version of the stable branches of the drivers. So there's a new release there on the project front page, 8.2.1. They're all Linux Foundation sign drivers, so you don't need to put your system into testing mode to use them, which is quite handy, because Windows 10 is a pain like that. And the other thing I want to mention is we have some new drivers. So first pair of drivers are new HID drivers. So HID, Human Interface Device. So there's a new class driver for the DKPD protocol, which is the protocol for keyboard and mouse, or keyboard and pointing device, I should say. And then we have the actual HID driver, which because of the way that uh, human interface devices work in Windows, you don't need separate keyboard and pointing, uh, pointing drivers. You can just have one driver that does the both jobs. So why do we want those? Well, on the screen, on the back. Um, you can see that Normally, in an HVM config, when you're on Windows, you're going to have USB set to one, USB device set to tablet. And the, the reason you did this is to avoid this scenario, which, uh, because I couldn't do a live demo, or I have to do a live demo, uh, should hopefully find the video, isn't it? There we go. So you can't really see it. Yeah, it's not going to come out well on the screen. But what happens is basically you get divergent mouse pointers because when we turn off the USB device, uh, the only thing that can be synthesized is a PS2 mouse, which is obviously a relative pointing device. So when you move your mouse pointer over your VNC window, all you're feeding into the VM is the relative movements. There's no absolute coordinates. So therefore, you end up with the mouse pointer just getting out of sync, which makes it really, really hard to drive. Um, that's completely solved when you install these two things, because that PID drive there will supply um, Actually, I've, yeah, so the, the, it's like the keyboard, which I haven't expanded here. But you can see it's got hit compliant mouse, and that's actually not a mouse, really. It's a tablet. It supplies absolute coordinates, so you don't get that uh, diversion pointer problem anymore. And then the other drive we've got is a new console driver. Um, and this is kind of useful um, because it means we can do this. So hopefully, the screen will stay. So, yeah, this is a a shell into DOM0, so I'm going to do Excel console and the name of my VM. So now I'm on essentially the serial console of a Windows VM. So I'm logging in as a user. Now I'm on the command shell. So the command shell is running on that VM. So I'm going to do some magic now. That's still bash. You, yeah, you, you, we, we can put a bash shell. I mean, there is a bash shell, so we should be able to get it to work. So we're going to use a little tool called PSExec, which is supplied by SysInternals. And when I run that from the console, a press code, the calculator, appears in the window. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is yeah, kind of a, it's a toy, but um, so yeah, I've got a command shell set on the front end of that thing, but we could actually put something on it. So, so for Zen servers internal use, we might choose to put, say, our ZenRT test daemon on the front end of that console, which means that now we no longer, no longer need a functional network <coughs> before we can actually start talking to the VM to get it to do run to run tests. So that, that would be kind of a useful thing. Um, we could put, I mean, one, one of the slightly happy things we have in Zen server is we have a mechanism to sync the clipboard between our Zen center console and the VM. At the moment, that runs in a very, very horrible way using Zen store. Yeah. But we can use this mechanism to actually pipe the clipboard data through into the VM as well. So it's, uh, it's a kind of a useful piece of infrastructure. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and, uh, and take questions. Yeah, questions? Uh, you said that uh, driver uh, registered both uh, old and new uh, interfaces with different names. Uh, well, interfaces with the same name but different versions, potentially. Uh, but it uses P the PDO naming scheme, so you mean these two, di these different names here? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the interface name doesn't change, the the actual device name will change. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, how do you prevent uh, to uh, loading uh, two versions of the same uh, driver at the same time? Well, I mean, potentially uh, that will happen while there's a transition period. 
Um, so Windows can actually load two different versions of a function driver against uh, a bus driver, uh, but eventually it will notice that it has outdated versions of a function driver and it will always try and bring everything up to date. So yeah, Windows has a, has a mechanism of scoring the drivers that, when it loads them. Uh, and I think the, the, the primary, uh, the other thing that, that trumps everything else is the, the build date. So the newest build date is always gone for first, then the actual newest build version that you put in your driver, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff comes after that. So yeah, when you, it, when you upgrade that um, provider driver, and it suddenly grows a new name because you've added a new version of an interface, Windows will then basically scan through driver store to see what the most recent version of the driver it's got so that name is, and it will say, okay, right, now I can load that one. As I said, that means you can actually sort of preload that new version of the function driver before you upgrade the bus driver. Because we then, all, all the Windows will do when you load the package is just put it in driver store, and then it will see if it can use it. And if you can't use it, that's fine, it just sits in driver store. Then you upgrade that bus driver, Windows goes, do I, is there anything I can do? Oh yeah, look, there's a new driver over there, now I can load it. Okay, thank you. Uh, what do you need uh, from QM or something to use that hidden driver? Sorry? Uh, to use that mouse, uh, mouse driver. Oh, the new, the new head driver? Um, I think by default, um, Excel will create the PV, VKVD backend. Um, so it's just there. Uh, if you turn off the USB tablet device and install those drivers, I think it should, should just work. You need a reasonably recent version of QM. I think you need 2.10 onwards. Uh, so QME will automatically pull back to the PV keyboard if available? QME will always synthesize, well, if you, if you specify USB, we always have QME create the USB device, and that can be there as well if you want, but, uh, but it will always create the PS2 mouse for you and the PS2 keyboard. Uh, so that they will always be there, uh, but uh, QME has a mechanism by which um, it kind of has a hierarchical order of things which it prefers to use, and if, uh, if a front end binds to the, to the PV protocol, then the, the, the synthetic one, uh, yeah, the, the emulated one kind of just gets disabled. Keystrokes don't go in there. Otherwise, yeah, you get like two keystrokes for <laughs> rest. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, you said that it's possible to use Windows Update to update the driver. That's right, yeah. We, for a sense of 7.0, we've been posting LPD drivers onto Windows Update. So if you're running Zen server, you will get, and you're licensed, you will, you will get drivers from Windows Update. And that's just do it using naming magic. Um, so yeah, we have this sort of, uh, when, when, when you build the PV drivers yourself, um, you, the name format is generally um, XP for Zen Project underscore the device ID that you know, it is sort of the intent to bind the entire infrastructure to, so normally that's like 0001, which is the, the Zen platform device, and then all the naming information comes after that. But for Zen Serve, we build our, our drivers with the names XS for Zen Serve underscore C000, so that, that magic PV device that I talked about, and then all the naming infrastructure after that. And we post our drivers onto Windows Update with that particular naming style built in, so they will only download onto Zen Serve at the end. But with a little bit of magic, you can build the PV drives yourself with those new names, and you could create the infrastructure in your VM with those new names, and you will get the drivers from Windows Update. You'll get Citrix branded drivers, but they will work. Thank you. Can you explain how the interrupt vector? Can you explain how the interrupt vector is decided for PV driver and the Windows kernel? Because I think Windows Corporation is the only dictator for the kernel, and I don't know if we can use any predefined vector, like in Linux kernel. When you, when Windows uh, wants to request a vector from the system, um, it it says basically supplies kind of a, a set of constraints. Um, so it says like, I want the message signal vector, I want it to be affinitized to these CPUs, so you supply a mask. But otherwise you don't really have any control over which precise vector gets allocated to you. Um, Windows 11 has a data structure which tells you which, which, which vector you've got allocated on different CPUs. And you, there's no, say you, say you want a vector on all CPUs, there's nothing, that, there's nothing that's gonna say to Windows that it has to be the same vector on all CPUs. So, um, actually what we have is we have um, all the PV drives, yeah, they generally use Zen event channels, but each of the event channels is just multiplexed onto a single interrupt vector, but something that was added in like Zen oh, 4.7, 4.6, something like that. With so you mean you can, 
one went through for each new yeah, attack. Yeah, what it used to be was it was one level sensitive vector for every single event in the system that always came in on CPU zero. Oh. Um, so what we added in like Zen 4.6 was we added a, the ability to ask, uh, to register a vector on, it, on, on different CPUs. So we have a, a per CPU vector hypercall now. So what we do is we ask Windows for a vector on each CPU, and then we say, right, on CPU zero, I'm gonna say to Zen, the event channel's coming on that vector. For CPU one, the event channel's coming on that vector. For CPU two, the event channel's coming on that vector. These are edge triggered vectors now, because they don't need to be shared. Uh, and that way, we can get, we can actually do event channel binding now on different CPUs and Windows. Okay, but that vector value is the different for different VM. It's not like Linux, we use the same vector. Well, there was this old mechanism where you had something, I don't know what it's called, called vector or something like that, which is a kind of a slightly gross hack in Zen, but that you, you actually did require to have exactly the same vector on each CPU for that to work, because you only had one shot of registering a single number, rather than having a single, well, and being able to submit the hypercore on different CPUs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think I'm out of time. <laughs> yeah. So, how about you guys uh, <coughs> take a break and have more, you know, we're sort of running behind schedule. Um, <coughs> but while uh, while we're trying to set this one up, um, which is quite working yet, actually, you can take more questions. See yeah, any more questions? <coughs> All right. Okay, I think we want to break. Thank you.